Good afternoon. Hope everyone had a good lunch. Yes. yes, good. So let's get a little bit, because it's after lunch, let's just get a little bit of interaction going, right? So uh, I know you don't have a mic or anything, but you know, just speak out loud. Um, so let me ask, start with asking this very simple question. What is the one product that you will not live your life without? A product, I mean, yes, not food, not water, not survival aspects, just a product that you consider essential in your life. Where do you read your books on? Most of you especially. Audible. Kindle, on Audible, right? Chances are that's on your phone, right? So how many of you think, really, that every day, the first thing you reach for, almost, is your phone, right? If you drive away from your home, right, and you realize your books aren't with you, you may be able to say, you know, I can live my life. Mm -hmm. How many of you will turn right around to pick up your phone that you left at home? I would never leave my phone. You would never leave your phone at home, thank you, right? So why is it that this phone, and Eric told us that the iPad wasn't even available. iPod wasn't even available in 2001, right? The smartphone as we know it was actually introduced um, around 2005, 2006. Yes, you had the Blackberries and so on before, right? But why is it that in this last 15 years, the person that slept in 2001 would wake up in 2021 and say, what's this gizmo, right? Why is this? that this has become so essential to your lives. What does it do for you? It has information, okay. It's most fit for its purpose. It's most fit for, oh, come on, Dave, you're already getting to the point. You know, this is a distraction. Don't worry about, you know, whether it's fit for my purpose or not. But what is your, what, is, what do you do with it? Everything. Everything, okay. Email, so it helps you communicate with the people in your life, right? It has information on it, so it helps you organize your life, put your stuff in a calendar, get from one place to another, right? Music. Music. So, and it has GPS, right? Remember the triptych days? Yeah. <laughs> right? Some of you aren't even, weren't even born at the time that we used triptychs to go from place A to B, right? But now we've got GPS. So if you think about your life, it's really, the places you go, the people you meet, and the things that you do. Yes? And this phone has become essential to us because it allows us to do all three. Agreed? Right? So it organizes our world for us. We're going to come back to this in a second. Right? What does that have to do, Rashri, with a central purpose? Now, come on. Right? We're talking about phones. Well, I am a professor of strategy and entrepreneurship, and I do teach about technology. So I thought I'd begin with that. But really, what I want to talk to you about is this concept of designing your life, your world, around a central purpose. So because I'm a professor of entrepreneurship, I think about the term enterprise very, very seriously. By the way, how many of you have an iPhone? How many of you, and who makes an iPhone? Apple, right? Who's the CEO of Apple? Tim Cook now, used to be Jobs before, right? The iconic founder. How many of you have an Android? Okay, so you have an iPhone? Right. Would you be willing to switch with them for their Android? You wouldn't switch. I you you were um. He's like no way. I was an Android user before I trained in America, in England. I had an Android, so I'd be open. Right. Yeah. Okay. But you're saying no way. Well, I had an iPhone, and now I found that Android works better for my personal purposes. Yeah. So that's why I would never switch. Does anyone want to switch their iPhone with him? No. Right. So notice that we're not just talking about phones. We're saying nah. -uh. Even this product, the iPhone versus the Android, right? A Google uh, system. We're not going to switch be between them. 
right? So it's not just a smartphone. It is a particular type of smartphone. And of course, these are all being created by enterprising people. Or the way that we term, so Merriam Dictionary defines enterprise in three ways. Now, typically, we think about enterprise as a unit of economic organization or activity, as in Apple is an enterprise. Right? But I want us to focus on this other meaning, too. A project or undertaking that is particularly daring, complicated, or risky, or the readiness to engage in daring and difficult action. And if you think about how the iPhone or a smartphone has become so essential to you, why is it that it has become so? What do you think Tim Cook is thinking of so that his product has become an essential component of your life? It's not just a nice to have. It's a need to have. How does he go about doing that? The look, the design, the aesthetics. You have an iPhone, it's like, oh wow, like, especially when it's first signed up, so if you got an iPhone, dang, like you've got an iPhone, like, you know, especially when it's expensive and more than everybody available as it is today. So there is, there are some features that he is focusing on that of course provide benefit to you, right? So that's one of the key questions that Tim Cook is thinking about in order to make the products created in his enterprise essential to you. But why does he care about whether it's essential to you or not? Pardon? That's why you buy it. Why does he care about you buying it? Money, OK. OK. S status, satisfaction, OK. Now we're getting the more general answers, right? But I'm going to su submit to you that one of these four questions that Tim Cook asks himself has been captured by the answers up until now. And again, why do we care about Tim Cook and Apple to begin with? Because what I want to say to you is, are you living your life as the CEO of My Enterprise, Inc? What would be the four fundamental questions that you need to be asking of yourself and providing answers to so that you can say that I am living the fullest life that I can? So what you're going to see today are concepts that are very congruent to what Craig talked about this morning. Right? So he provided, I thought, a beautiful causal chain about thinking about what is it that you value, and then making this actionable so that you can live a flourishing life. You'll see that the four questions that I'm going to propose to you and their answers are going to help you in a complementary manner to achieve it. So we've got one of the four questions. Thinking like a CEO really requires you to first and fundamentally ask the question, what is my purpose or mission statement? What does success look like for me? How do I know that I've achieved my purpose? How do I know that I'm doing things that I want to do, these actions that I want to do? The third question is what all of you nailed. What's my value proposition? Right? That's about providing others features with benefits, right? And the fourth question is, with whom should I trade? Now, I saw a lot of nodding hand, heads for the first three questions. The fourth question, does that resonate with you too, just as much as the others? Maggie says, yes, it does, partly because she's seen me present this before too. If it doesn't immediately seem to make sense, let's wait till the end. And then you can ask me questions about why this fourth question, which I believe is just as important as the first two. So let's very quickly go through with the answers to each of these, these questions, frameworks 
that all of us ought to use. And then I'm going to give you examples of how I personally have contextualized these answers for myself. Right? So what's my purpose or mission statement? This is exactly what the talk is about, designing your life around a central purpose. Now, I'm going to focus here on creative and productive endeavors. Because as objectivists, we know that consumption is a secondary activity. Producing is fundamental. And it's fundamental not only because it gives you money, but also because it gives you psychological self-esteem. Happiness is hard earned. It requires a lot of work because it's that state of consciousness of achieving one's values. So as Craig talked about this morning, it begins with having to define not only what your values are, but then how are these values being embodied in your purpose? Solving problems that are deeply meaningful to you is what really defines what your purpose ought to be. In John Allison's words, it's about making the world a better place by doing something important to yourself. Now, in this audience, I don't necessarily need to go into the details for why be doing something important to yourself is a fundamental element of your purpose. However, I get two reactions that you may already have also had for the first one. Be honest, how many of you rolled your eyes at me? Making the world a better place, Rashri, how cliche is that? Yes, right? Or oh, making the world a better place, that's all about others. That's, isn't that altruism? What are you talking about here? Right? Or a third one could be, wait a minute, making the world a better place? I, as one person, oh, solving world hunger? Getting rid of climate change, that's what I get most of the time, right? And how can I, as one person, do it? But let's go back to that iPhone or to your Android. What's your world? The places you go, the things that you do, and the people that you meet. If that's your world, and these are determined by your choices, then you no longer need to roll your eyes about it being cliched. Because the people in your life are important to you. The places that you go, Dave Walden built this beautiful home in Georgia he was telling me about, right? Craig was talking about how he got this sense of thriving and flourishing in the lake. I can't pronounce it, so I'm not even going to try um, what the name of the lake was, right? But the places you go, the things that you do, these are your choices. Of course, they're important. So it's not cliched, right? And because it's your world, it's not paralyzing either, because now you're in your sphere of influence, right? So think about what is it? What problem is deeply meaningful to you because it resonates with what you deeply value? Right? And then think about the places you go, the people you meet, and the things that you do as your world in terms of solving those problems for you. For me, a deep value for me is education. My husband, by the way, and I'll be talking about Rob a little bit more later too, he, he appreciates education, absolutely. Right? He's, our family is all about education too. But he also likes fishing. So he just bought this um, uh, poster which says, education is important, but fishing is importer. <laughs> <laughs> but given that my high value is education, my purpose is about enabling upward mobility, not just in the economic, but also in the psychological and intellectual realms. 
Okay. You can see now that the contextualization of your purpose statement needs for you to think about what do you want your life's work to be? In service to which values? Right? And so, of course, you're taking for granted the scaffolding of all of the objectivist principles, but you're applying it to yourself. And you apply it to yourself by asking exactly the kind of questions that Craig was talking about earlier. Right? And we're going to get into some of those issues a little bit later, too. Okay. The second question, what does success look like to me? And I say in five years. Why in five years? Because I do not want you to be thinking about writing your own obituary. Right? That, for me, is, you know, that's what people say. No, you should write out what your obituary should say about yourself. That's way too morbid for me. I want to live my life. Right? And I want to be forward looking. And so this is also getting to that question that Craig was asked about Jordan Peterson, right? You've got multiple selves. No, you've got one self. And that self will evolve and grow as it should. Right? And you need to be thinking in terms of chunks of time where it's far enough that you can achieve your purpose. But it's close enough that you can visualize it. Right? It may be five years, seven years, four years, it doesn't matter. That's arbitrary. The time itself is arbitrary. It's the point about how can you, can you visualize your goals, your success factors. So how might you approach this question? How many of you have seen the movie The Martian? Yes? OK, do you like it? Yeah. Yes? If you haven't seen it, please do see it. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Why is that the case? Well, what is The Martian about? I just told you I didn't like to talk about death, right? What's Martian about? Survival, right? Because this guy's caught alone in Mars, right? No communication, not enough food, right? How does he come back? So the tagline of the movie is bring him home. Part of the reason why I love The Martian is this is all about doing a particular task, finishing up a complete purpose, right? And everyone, Ma Mark Watney in Mars and everybody else on Earth, they're unified by the same one purpose, which is bring him home, right? So there is no relational conflict as such. There is, however, this desire to finish up a task, an important purpose that has to be achieved. Right? The other reason why I like this movie is within five minutes, I was so surprised, and excuse my language, right? I was laughing my ass off within five minutes, right? Because even though it was so serious, supposedly, right? And it's a sci-fi movie. And I'm not a sci-fi person, honestly. I'm too much of a nerd to be a sci-fi um, person. But the reason I love this is because he has this very nice can-do, upbeat personality, right? Except for one time in the movie. Spoiler alert for those of you who haven't seen the movie. This is when the captain of the ship has already turned around to bring him back, but he believes that he's going to run out of food to survive. So he says to the captain, tell my parents. 30-something single guy sending his last message to his parents. What would you say? Tell my parents, I love what I do, and I'm good at it. And I'll be dying for something big and beautiful. Tell them I can live with that. Being able to define success not in terms of status or money or reputation, but in this moment where you feel like you're in a calling. Right? I love what I do, and I'm good at it. Often we can say of the things that we do, I'm good at it. Or we can say, I love what I do. But being able to say both of them at the same time, 
That's what I think success looks like. So that brings me to my first matrix about how do you go about making sense of what I'm saying to you. So if you've defined your purpose already, for me, it's about enabling upward mobility. Right? But how do I go about doing it? Take all of the activities that need to be decomposed in order to achieve that purpose. Right? Or as Craig was talking about earlier, it's complex. It's a system. So what are the activities that you need to have done in order for your purpose to be achieved? Make a list of them. Right? And then what you want to do with those activities in mind, because your purpose is central, any activity that does not satisfy that purpose does not belong in this list. You may have it for some other purpose. And you can have your grand purpose, and you can have project-related purposes too. right? But the focus of the activities that you're going to put in this matrix, it belongs only if it serves your purpose. And what you want to do is make sure that your purpose is achieved as best as you can. So you can take those activities. And on the x-axis is your ability. What are you good at? On the y-axis is aspiration, what you love. If the activities that you're spending most of your time on are ones which you're neither good at nor love, that is what I call a misery quadrant. Right? That negative that Craig was talking about. Right? What you don't hate and what you're not good at. If the activities are what you love, but you're not good at, that's a hobby. And that's not going to allow you to achieve the purpose the best you can. Right? By the way, the term hobby comes from the term hobby horse, a pony that is in a village fair going round and round, but not really achieving anything. If you're good at it, but you don't love it, that's just another job. Those are what I call chores. I have to do it, and I'm good at it, so I'll do it, but they're not the ones that have got me feeling like I'm in my calling quadrant. Right? Now, here's what happens. You can take these activities today, map them in here, and they'll be all over the place, right? in all four quadrants. But you want to end up moving them into your calling quadrant, or hang on, your misery quadrant. OK? So hang on to that thought about the misery quadrant for just a second. But about the calling quadrant, what happens? If you love something, you want to invest to become better at it. So then you become good at it. And if you're good at something, it gives you a sense of self-esteem. So you love doing it. So there's this virtuous spiral that you can create for yourself as you are evolving yourself and achieving your purpose. Okay? But keep in mind that if it is a purpose that is particularly daring or difficult to do, and if it is one that's solving big problems, you can't do it alone. So just as important as identifying the activities that are in your calling quadrant are important to identify what's in your misery quadrant, what you don't want to do, what you're not good at. Because those are the places that you're going to find somebody else to do it with you. So let me instantiate it for both success for me, and then I'm also going to use an example of a specific project, which started off as a summer project. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But success for me, given my mission, is to create new knowledge and develop educational programs that empower lifelong learners from high school 
through professional context. You can see why this is something I love doing. You can see it on my face. And you better believe I'm good at it. In fact, the frameworks that I'm providing you right now, I'm hoping will be helpful to you. Because I've seen it help others in taking these concepts seriously and applying it towards themselves. I do it within the Ed Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets. Ed Snyder, as many of you may know, was one of Ayn Rand's friends and in fact helped co-found Ayn Rand Institute too. Uh, he was also an alum of University of Maryland. right? And so when he endowed the Ed Snyder Center with me as the founding director, for me, this was an opportunity to bring my philosophy and my professional life together in an integrated manner. So a lot of the things that we do in the Snyder Center, including the self-summer program that's running as we speak, is about providing these tools and frameworks and doing research in these areas. But rather than talking about me, let me talk to you about Rob's Bronco. That's my husband again. <laughs> He's a car enthusiast, right? My eyes gloss over when he talks about all of the problems that he's solving. Rob's Bronco circa 2004 was what my daughters thought they were giving him because they had made the money as a Father's Day present, right? And Rob and I went along with it. But this is something that's really important because since 2004, all the way till 2015, Rob has been working on this and he has constructed this Bronco, which is like really cool to go off-roading on. Right? And I did that just four weeks ago in West Virginia, and we almost wanted to listen to John Denver as we were doing that. Right? So here's Rob's Bronco that he's built, and now my daughters have grown up, and they're like, Dad, we can drive too. So my younger daughter, who had just turned around 15 or 16 at that time, was about to get her driver's license, says, Dad, I want to build something with you too, so that I can go off-roading with you. Right? But Rob's a Ford guy. And see, I don't know that Ford guys, I mean, you know, he gets very offended when people call his Bronco a Jeep, right? It's a car, it's a truck, whatever, right? That's, please, this recording I cannot show him. <laughs> but my daughter wanted a Jeep Wrangler, right? So this is actually concepts that I was developing for Maggie's Strive program, right? Right around. 2015, so I kid you not. I had just created this concept of ability and aspiration matrix in my head. So Rob was confused. He's like, well, there are, for every one Bronco that I can buy, there are like 800 Jeeps that I can buy secondhand to work on. So I don't even know how to go about looking for it. So I whipped out this ability and aspiration matrix and I asked Rob, I said, what do you love doing when you're working on cars? What are you good at? What do you hate doing? So he said, well, he used to do all of the electrical stuff, loves working on the guts, the engine, the transmission, can't weld for his life, and is a really, really bad painter. So what do you think we got as this summer 2015 project? What kind of a Jeep do you think we bought? One that looks good but doesn't run. Body work, fabulous. No need for painting and welding. You can see that it's a nice white Jeep with a black hood. Everything's fine, right? But transmission was blown up, missing engine, right? And I say summer 2015 because it's finally ready now. Wow. Yesterday was when he said, OK, I nailed it. The belt does not come off. And you can see that both my daughters are working on it with him. Sometimes willingly, sometimes not so willingly. Right? But my point is that even when you're taking on a project, you can think about the activities, how to get a great looking Jeep that runs well so that both Rob and his daughter can go four-wheeling together, right? 
And Rob is enjoying the journey, not just the destination, because he's focusing on what he loves doing and what he's good at. So that's what you need to be thinking about. And I give you this example because you can think about it as your central purpose, or you can think about it as a specific project. It doesn't matter. right? But this is how you define what success looks like for you. Which gets me to the third question. What's my value proposition? This is the one you guys nailed. Because you are the consumers that are benefiting from the smartphones that are being provided. right? But think about it. Tim Cook had to decide that he was going to focus his life's creative activities around solving these problems for you. right? But what problems is he solving for you? That's that third question. What's my value proposition? Again, in, say, five years. So here I'm going to use the quote by Steve Jobs, where he says, I don't think it's good that we're perceived as different. I think it's important that we're perceived as much better. If being different is essential to being better, then we have to be different. What he's focusing on here is not differences for differences sake, but differences that provide value. Which gets me then to your feature benefit matrix. Here, you're still focusing on the activities that need to be done. But now you're talking or thinking about whether you are not only good at this activity, but you're uniquely positioned to provide the highest value doing this activity. And the y-axis is the benefit to the other, the value to the customer. If you're in the activities where you're neither uniquely positioned to provide that value, nor are you providing the best value. That's no distinctive value. The activities that are in this top quadrant, where it's beneficial to others, but you're not uniquely positioned, there are lots of other people that can do it, those activities, then you're a cog in a wheel, easily replaceable. If you're different, but it's not providing much value, you're the prince and the bell of the ball, but nobody's coming to your party. So again, where you want to be is this sense of being indispensable. You want to focus those activities that provide high value and where you are uniquely situated. And one of the things I often come across here is, but wait a minute, how can I be the one and the only in this entire world? And we stump ourselves by defining uniqueness as being the one and the only. Going back to be unique in your world, in the places that you, you go, the things that you do, and the people that you meet. So there might be a lot of others that provide value in doing these things. But in your sphere of influence, you are the go-to person. Again, that makes the task and the purpose more manageable. And you don't have to now start thinking or be stymied or paralyzed that if you're not the one and only in the entire world out there, then you've got no value to offer, right? Or you're not necessarily doing the activities that you need to do. So an example of this in terms of me, what's my value proposition? There are a lot of strategy and entrepreneurship professors out there. My unique value proposition in my sphere of influence is my ability to integrate my research, my teaching, my engagement, so that I can create unique programs that cater to the needs of the innovative and the entrepreneurial spirit. Notice my values are being embodied. Not only the value I'm providing to others, but what I personally value. And the objectivism element for sure screams at you in that last part, which provide the skills, the savvy, and the moral ground for the producer and the value creator. 
How do I do that? I give a lot of talks. I teach a lot of courses. I interview people that embody my values, and I provide them as events. We have debates and discourses where Yaron Brook debated with a person who was representing socialism, for instance. right? And we had capitalism versus socialism. But then these are the people that I have chosen to be on the stage to expose the students at University of Maryland to ideas that I deeply believe are true and are also ones that will help them lead flourishing lives so that they can challenge these either or dichotomies that are often presented to them. But I want to take, talk about an application out here too. About two years ago, Sarah Wallach and I met. Sarah had worked both in the private sector as well as in the public nonprofit sector. And she was getting increasingly dissatisfied with observing the fact that people five or 10 years out in great jobs, supposedly, earning good money too, didn't feel that they were living fulfilling lives. And the focus of the enterprise that they were part of seemed not to be on people, but on systems and processes. And what she realized is that really, she wanted to work on solving this problem of living life intentionally. By the way, Mary Lee Dahl, who also works with me, ran the Ayn Rand Institute's uh, Atlas Shrugged book program for the last 20, 25 years. Sarah was one of the beneficiaries who walked in to an undergraduate office and saw this essay competition and said, hmm, I want to read this book. So today, she is the director of my intentional life lab that Carl Barney, through CEHE, has very generously supported so that we can develop courses which take the six pillar approach. Three of the pillars stand for me, the enterprise element of the Ed Snyder Center, purpose and character, because that's what we're talking about today. Wellness, if you're not physically well, if you're not mentally well, you cannot accomplish your purpose and you're definitely not living flourishing lives. Financial prosperity is very important. Money is a good thing. Allows us to get what we value and pursue what, we, what our goals are. So that's about me. The other three pillars stand for us. Relationships, the people in your life are by your choice. You value these relationships. You want to be nurturing these relationships. They bring joy to you. Communities, we're in our chosen community here. Used to be that we thought about villages as ones that you were born in and the ones that you died in. But now we can move and we can create communities of our choices. And nature, this morning, Craig started off with why being in harmony with nature is so important. So our intentional life lab takes the six pillar approach. But Sarah couldn't do it herself. And so she and I, or she and the Ed Snyder Center, came together thinking about, so what's Sarah's value proposition matrix out here? Sarah is not focusing on the administrative needs or the pedagogical expertise or my own knowledge and relationships. That's something that she's relying on me and the Snyder Center to develop, deliver. What she brings to the table and what she's unique and providing high value at is entrepreneurial creativity, the combination of economics and psychology and empathy, and of course, her practical experiences. 
So you can see again why coming together here delivers on that purpose, both for her and for me. And that's just one example, a concrete example. Which then brings us to the with whom should I trade, which I hope you see now is a very evident fourth question that you should be asking, and which of course brings me to what I consider to be one of the most noble principles ever written, the trader principle. A trader does not treat men as masters and slaves, but as independent equals. He deals with men by means of free, voluntary exchange, an exchange which benefits both parties by their own independent judgment. What seems to be lost today in this win-lose discourse, where you're either a perpetrator or a victim or a savior, is this truly benevolent premise of a trader principle where fundamentally we are equal. We may no more, no less, have some aspects more than others, but the creation of voluntary relationships allows you to bring those two elements of your purpose together. The benefit to you doing something important for yourself, what you love doing. Benefit to the other making the world a better place. If neither are being achieved, you're in a lose-lose situation. The problem with a lose-win or a win-lose is that it's not sustainable because one of the parties is gonna walk away and you're gonna be ending up in a lose-lose. So who do you trade with? You sustain, you create, sustain, and nurture win-win relationships. And notice that in the two examples that I've given you, trade can be through markets, as in Rob's Jeep example, or it can be through intra-organizational relationships, as in Sarah and I choosing to work together. So who do I trade with? I trade with like-minded people who are drawn by this positive vision that free and creative individuals who are driven to excel and in trading value for value make the world a better place. I trade with people who create a virtuous spiral between ability and aspiration in both themselves and in others. These are some of my trade partners within the organization and the Snyder Foundation and the Koch Foundation that have provided donor support for the center. I can talk a lot about this whole seeming dichotomy, by the way, about funders that are taking academic integrity and freedom away by, um, um, by insisting on their values. I think that's just such a false dichotomy, right? Because if I'm taking money from a donor, when I'm not aligned on values, I'm betraying myself. And my academic integrity is not for sale. I put that up there because the Koch Foundation has been doing a lot of flack from a lot of other people precisely because of this aspect of academic freedom issues and so on. I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, so enterprising ability and aspirations, the answers to the four questions. What's your purpose? Making the world a better place to live by doing something important for yourself. What does success look like? Loving what you do and being good at it. Your value proposition should be about creating unique features in yourself that provide value in trade. And you wanna seek win-win relationships because collaboration, not competition is the hallmark of trade. So what does this mean? I've noticed that I'm not saying that being enterprising is a lone wolf, lonely endeavor. And in fact, as I said before, if you truly care about your purpose, and it's big, you want to be organizing with others that share your values and are complementary in your skills. So fundamentally, what's an organization? Such as TOS, this conference. It wasn't, you know, so we've got lots of speakers such as me, but John and all of the people that are working tirelessly behind the scenes, right? Everything has to come in place. 
each and every one of us, these individuals that are participating and providing you an experience that is hopefully helpful to you, we're composed of individuals with different goals, different skills, different beliefs. But an organization is one that unifies these people with a common purpose, achieved, of course, through specialization, coordination, and, of course, governance. So when I was first presenting this talk at Strive that Maggie organized, Kendall Hustiano provided a framework that I thought just bought it out very nicely together. And so the trader Sudoku is really a nine pieces of the puzzle. When we think about trade, we think about, let's just look at it as a two-person trade. There's a me and there's a you. And we often just focus on the transaction. What am I doing? What are you doing? But underlying those transactions is what are we trying to achieve together? How does this fit in my aspiration? How does it fit in yours? How do I bring capabilities to the table? How do they complement your capabilities? So a trade is really this complex system of each individual coming together in trade voluntarily. And you can have three or four person trades just by adding columns. What unifies is that common purpose, common objective. Right? But you need to think very deeply about what you are providing for value to your trade partner and what is the other person providing to you. Right? Which is why you not only need to think about your own aspirations and your own capabilities and your own actions, but also the choices represented in your trade partner's activities. You already heard some of these books earlier. I personally also like James Clear and Cal Newport's Deep Work. John Allison has a great book on leadership crisis and the free market cure. I write quite often for the Forbes. And in particular, when COVID hit, and I saw that everybody was getting depressed and stuff, right? So I ended up writing this one op-ed, which is about movies, and I have eight movies there. Some of them are Bollywood movies, by the way. So Song and Dance, right? Like them, I mean, that's my culture showing there too. But you know, and some of them, like The Martian makes it to that list too. So there are eight movies here which really celebrate enterprise and help you regain a sense of life. So if you'd like that, um, highly recommend you going to that too. I'll leave you with two quotes, both by Eric Hoffer, actually. In times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped in, to live in a world that no longer exists. <laughs> Not only is this true for all of us, but it's particularly resonant for me. If I say to myself I'm an endowed professor and I'm a learned person, I've actually signed my death certificate. So what I've appreciated about coming to conferences like this is learning from other like-minded people too, because that's what keeps me young. That's what is valuable to me. And then finally, aspiration. We're often told that talent creates its own opportunities, but it sometimes seems that intense desire creates not only its own opportunities, but also its own talents. This is about the goal setting and the aspirational aspect of creating a purpose and designing your life around it by acquiring and leveraging abilities that help you achieve your highest values. Thank you. So I'm going to stand here and look at you. So now you're not a silhouette for me. Right. <laughs> Let's go up. OK, so uh, so great talk. Um, thanks for that. OK. All 
All right, so my question is, so I agree with everything you said about doing what you love, do what you're good at, do stuff that provides great value to people, a unique value proposition. So my question is, based on all that, what what would be your, what one action item should I have to take action today, based on all that? If you had to pick one. Um, I would say define your purpose first, and then break down the activities that require you to achieve, that you need to do to acquire, achieve those activities. That itself is deep thinking. But then once you take that first action, you'll immediately be propelled into your next set of actions. So there was a reason why I had that flow of the four questions being in the manner that they were. Hey, um, sort of similar to that last question, um, I really appreciate the visual of the matrix and having that recur throughout. Um, I think in my experience, you know, I've spent a lot of time in that bottom left quadrant, not because it's the right place to be, but because it's comfortable, because yes. it's scary to move out of it. Um, can you talk about, you know, approaching that fear and moving past it? Yeah, and, and that's one of the reasons, thank you for asking that question, right? Because actually, it's not a fear that you feel only when you're starting off. To be very honest, I personally am confronting that fear right now, right? Because you get into a zone where you're comfortable, you've achieved your purpose, and then you start feeling like, wait a minute, am I just doing what I'm comfortable doing? What's my next uh, aspect? And so two things that happen, both as cues for when you need to be redoing this for yourself, and also ways in which you can start doing it. So first and foremost is this notion that you said, right? I'm comfortable. We define the term enterprise as daring and difficult action. By the way, that is not to discount comfort. Comfort's a good thing, right? Being comfortable in your skin actually comes after you have achieved what you wanted to achieve, right? So I would reframe and not make it a dichotomy between comfort and being comfortable equates to being fearful too, right? But then also allow ourselves to create that stretch goal, right? So you can, and it never happens like you wake up in the morning and you say, oh my gosh, I am living an awful life right, or I'm not happy anymore. It usually is a gradual process, right? So you pay attention, and this is why the thinking and reflecting and being intentional becomes so important. What you end up doing is paying attention to the cues. And are you doing things because you're comfortable and good at it and you're still loving it, in which case it's fine? Or are you starting to feel bored? Are you starting to feel dissatisfied? Are you feeling like there are external circumstances that are preventing you from achieving your purpose in the way that you had thought you were going to do it? So now you need to do a recourse, right? And especially that second part can be one where it's not internally driven but externally imposed on you, can create a lot of fear. It can create a lot of uncertainty. But even in those instances, if you go back to these as your touchstone, and then say, well, this is my purpose. This is how I've answered the questions up until now. Are they still true? What do I need to change? And then start approaching it in that way. Then the emotions you feel are not in the driver's seat. It's your intentionality and your thinking that's in the driver's seat. I hope that helped. Yeah, um, hi, so my question will be regarding the feature benefit metrics. So um, as a co-founder of startup, I know that you cannot be, you know, unreplaceable for all of the time. So why would you do if you are, you know, there are a lot of competitors and for example, you're not so unique in your position. So should you rethink these metrics or should you give up being, for example, irreplaceable in some one sphere and move to another? So what is your approach to that? Right, again, I would reframe it. So notice that the value proposition is in some ways saying 
You're reflecting about your capabilities and its uniqueness relative to others. I would still not put primacy on the others. I want, you know, you want to be reflective and realistic about what it is that you provide. But often we end up feeling like, oh, we're not unique or we're not going to be at our competitive advantage. Or I hate this term. Uh, the lean startup methodology talks about what's your unfair advantage. And for me, unfair takes you to a completely different place, right? But to answer your question more specifically, I would think about decomposing even further what you believe are your unique capabilities. And it may very well be that some are not as unique as you think you are, and others are very much so. So you can grow and cultivate those aspects a lot more about yourself, right? And by the way, competition is a secondary consequence of capitalism. That's what Ayn Rand talks about quite nicely and eloquently, right? Collaboration is really what uh, capitalism is about. Because those that collaborate extremely well are the ones that end up outcompeting the others. So often, and I say this to my PhD students who feel like they've been scooped. You know, in my, in my sphere, it is the ideas that you're creating, not the products and services, right? Oh, somebody else just created this and I'm scooped. I say to them, reverse that framing. Think about how you're gonna build on what they did and make something even better. Yes. Thank you for this talk. It was a great after lunch talk because now I'm energized. And the, gear, and the gears are like just uh, uh, whirring in my brain. I wanted to, uh, you made a great point that, you know, uh, when we set a big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, one person cannot re really achieve something really, really big and it's important to build a team. But do you have any uh, framework for thinking about, but it's very important to uh, whom you work with and whom you collaborate with and that becomes increasingly challenging depending on how innovative it is what you are doing. So I've built a great business which is doing really well, uh, but because it is fundamentally innovative, I'm having great difficulty finding, you know, I, I have employees, but like finding people to collaborate with and any thoughts or tips would be greatly appreciated. Sure, and we can talk a little bit more offline about it too. But, you know, <laughs> wow, music, I wanna dance too. Okay, um, so, we can talk offline too, because actually uh, that is a core part of what I do research in. And a particular study where I looked at entrepreneurs and how they created founding teams, right? Typically you end up going for, you know, the abilities, complementarity in the abilities in the trader Sudoku matrix, right? Most people end up focusing on what do you have that I need which complements what I have in order to achieve the purpose. And going back to Craig's terms, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. What is sufficient, and in fact even more important, is the alignment of values, of workplace values. I often say, I do not have to agree 100% with a person to work with them but I do need to agree with them 100% on the things that we're working on. So one way to approach this is to perhaps think through, maybe it's not just one person that is going to provide you the capabilities and the mindset either, but it's a work in progress. Figure out, first of all, the alignment in workplace values should be the consideration, and then you can get the complementary capabilities across a bigger team. And it really requires you as a team to come together to create what is jargon called transactive memory systems. But that what really that means is that a founding team or any team of collaborators need to agree on who knows what who's going to do what, and high trust that there's integrity, responsibility, and honesty, that people will do what they say if they say they're gonna do it. Those are the elements that need to come together. And it's true for startups being successful, and it's true 
in romantic relationships. One last question. Hi. Um, so I have a business that um, I have a good mission statement that I believe in. I am good at what I do, and I also love what I do. My problem is that my market, my buyers, are not people I enjoy interacting with. <laughs> so I have thought about either creating a website so that there's no human interaction, they can just go through that, or hiring a person who does the, who does the negotiations for me. Um, does that take away from the four points of the central purpose? Not at all, because that's your trade partners. You don't enjoy it. You're not good at it. Why would you want to do it? Right? On your end. And you're not even, by the way, you've reached, you've definitely achieved your purpose. If the activities in your calling mate cell are identical to the activities in your indispensable cell. Because that's what, if you think about what Craig was talking about as a Venn diagram way, right? What you're good at, what you love, and what others are willing to pay for, right? But you want to focus on you, but not the entire set of activities. So yeah, hire somebody that actually loves to deal with difficult people, if that's what they are. OK? They think that as a challenge in there. So a couple of things that I want to just leave you with, because we're out of time. I hope that these concepts will help you in terms of not only your professional aspects of your career, but also the personal aspects of your career. Because fundamentally, if you see the thread that runs through all of these concepts is about you defining what your values are and then taking the actions and the thinking to achieve those values. And to do so, you want to do it with a thriving sense that you love the people that are in your life too, both in your romantic and family and personal relationships, as well as in your professional relationship. And so the same concepts can be used in both aspects of your life and indeed help you integrate them so that there is no dichotomy between work-life balance. Work is part of life. Work gives you fun and enjoyment. But there is a lot more that you can be doing in your life. So rather than thinking about these as either ors, also what helps is that your values unify these either or conflicts for you. Thank you very much.